Well, it's really just a delight to be here, and uh, this is such a great gathering and that you guys are doing the work that I've been involved with for a long time of really thinking about how uh, blended learning, uh, t digital tools can enhance the kind of learning that we most value. So it's really just lovely to be here. And I'm looking forward to not just conversations with you, but just want to say at the outset, I'm sure I'll say it at the inset, at the end, <laughs> that uh, I would love if there's things as I'm talking and framing out what I'd like to share with you today, if you're thinking, oh, I have a great example of that, or I'm working on something that's in that line, I would love to hear from you. I'd love to have people email me or tweet at me, but preferably email, but I will respond to a tweet. And um, because I'm really interested in how people's thinking is evolving in this realm. So, so that, that, that's a really, really sincere open invitation to all of you. For many years, I've taught a course uh, at Georgetown called The Future of the University as a Design Problem. I've co-taught it for many years with this wonderful architect and designer named Ann Pendleton Julian. Now I'm teaching other versions of the course, not with Ann. But when Ann and I were teaching it, we started in 2013, so we would ask students to invent, these are undergraduates, to imagine what the university should look like in 2033, so 20 years out. And one of the things we would tell them is that you're not designing for content, you're designing for context. And so what that meant was we asked them, what do you think the conditions of knowledge, technology, learning and work will be in 15, 20 years? And what kind of graduate would you want to produce for that world? So and there were a lot of ways to think about what the world might be like in 15, 20, 30 years. And uh, we could talk about that all day. Uh, the part that I want to especially focus on here is the role that machine intelligence will play. Uh, I'm not going to totally talk about this, but to me this is an important backdrop I've been thinking a lot about. Um, you know, building off of the work of people like uh, Levy and Renane, who wrote that book in the early 2000s and widely available on the web is a publication called Dancing with Robots, if, if you haven't read that. But now there's a lot of people writing about this and basically asking the question, you know, what is it that machines do better than humans? What do humans do better than machines? And in 15, 20, 30 years, um, what work will be left to humans? And I, just as an aside, I think that after climate change, <laughs> the fact that there will probably just not be enough jobs for humans, that for the amount of humans there are, is probably like one of the existential threats that the generation we're training will live with. Right? So the students that we're teaching now in our, in our respective colleges, assuming they're sort of traditional age, um, you know, their careers will be peaking in like the 2040s and the early 2050s. In case you're wondering how I calculate when somebody's career is peaking, it's exactly what age I am. <laughs> That's how I got to the 2040s. But uh, so they say that like 20 years in the future, like this is what will be left to humans. There'll be uh, three kinds of work: Un solving unstructured problems, working with new information, or complex communication. Although that's even rapidly changing. I had like a 30-minute conversation with a computer to reboot my cable modem a few months ago. I mean, like literally 30 minutes, just step after step after step. And at one point, early on, I gave her my phone number and said, and she said, oh, I have your records in front of me. And I was like, wait, there, you don't have a front. <laughs> or a me. <laughs> but I think it's really brilliant that they actually they could have said, I, I see your records. I have, the, I have your records in front of me. <laughs> so that's it. And uh, other low-level menial labor. So we know we're training people for that. Uh, Again, a number of people writing about this, Daniel Suskind and his father, Richard Suskind, have a book called Future of the Professions. He has a TED talk that's pretty interesting. Um, and he lays out really clearly, you know, sort of a way to think about this, that there's sort of three things that happen in the race between humans and technology. First, there's machine superiority or tool superiority, which started when somebody figured out that a stick was better than your fingernail or something like that and has progressed since. 
Then there's where machines substitute for human labor, right? So a machine can make a shoe better than a person can make a shoe. But then there's machine human complementarity, which is then when you figure out how the machine can make the shoe better, the entire shoe industry changes, right? And good things and bad things happen from that. The shoemaker loses a job, people can buy cheaper shoes. Um, but that notion of complementarities become one of the mainstays of thinking about the history of the relationship between humans and technology. What is it about this, the process of superiority and substitution that then allows humans to do something much better? And that's why you're here. <laughs> right? So I think it's interesting, having been thinking about blended learning for almost 30 years now, like, not, not that you guys have been uh, thinking about it that long, not everybody in the room, but the way that you think about it. But it's interesting to think about blended learning in the context of this long narrative of the relationship between human and machines, superiority substitution, and then this drive for complementarity. And I think one of the really compelling questions, maybe the compelling question in education right now, is what is education's complementarity? What's the narrative that we really want to write around what it is that machines, machine intelligence, allows us to do much better than we've been doing. And I say, use the word write deliberately because I feel like higher education has never been good at writing a version of its future, right? For the most part, we have let Silicon Valley for the last 15 years write our future and has conflated the history of higher education with the, or sorry, the future of higher education with the future of technology. And for the most part, higher education, as John Seeley Brown once said to me, uh, universities are basically set up to look in the rearview mirror. And that's what they do best. So I, I mean, what does it look like to write a future around education <coughs> and complementarity? So here's the context in which I put that question. This is something I've been talking about and thinking about for a long time. So a couple of you may have seen parts of this before. I think that this is the central tension of our time right now, is between a fundamentally integrative and what I am quite non-judgmentally <laughs> calling disintegrative vision of education. Here's what I mean by that. So this is what I think of as the disintegrative side. It's these capacities that the digital enables, right? So be able to modularize and granularize experiences, uh, the ability to think about uh, you know, kind of competency-based learning at a very elementary level, this learning anytime, anywhere that you know, especially obsess people in the sort of rise and semi-fall of MOOCs over the last five years. And you know, the power of analytics that can track learning down to the micro level, right? And just to be clear, this is not going to be a list of good and evil at all. <laughs> the stuff on the left is really powerful, and I'm gonna actually argue we can't, we can't write a positive future for ourselves without the stuff on the left. But the reason that I call it disintegrative is that if that's all you're focused on, then I think you have a diminished vision of what learning and education is. I'm not accusing any of you of that at all, because that's why you're here. But this is very much the narrative about technology that's been powered by Silicon Valley for the last 15 years, is that the ability to create very targeted learning experiences, the whole discourse around unbundling higher education is very much driven by the stuff on the left and only the stuff on the left. So that then is complemented by the integrated side, which I, I'm guessing you guys live and don't need explained to you, right? So this is just our believing that learning is both curricular and co-curricular. We're not just teaching knowledge and skills, or certainly not just teaching content, but we're teaching ways of being, ways of thinking, mindsets. I'll get to that a little bit more in a second. And we're designing for the whole person. Um, I think that's at the heart of the liberal arts. I teach it. Catholic and Jesuit institution that has a long tradition of talking about educating the whole person, but I think it resonates to all of us. 
billions of dollars of venture capital pouring in on the left. Hundreds of dollars of venture capital. <laughs> Last year, four billion dollars of venture capital in the online learning space, and most of it driven by dreams of scaling, automating, um, you know, and and widely distributing higher education in unbundled forms. So, as somebody who's cared deeply about. I'll just use the term blended learning since the mid 80s um, and has always you know, trained in the humanities, teaching in a Catholic and Jesuit school. My experience is that for the most part, these two sides have not talked to each other much. The people devoted to the left don't care that much about the right. In fact, one could argue that Silicon Valley doesn't really actually believe in humans at all. <laughs> so if you read Franklin Ford's book, um, who's A World Without Mind, one of the anti-Silicon Valley books that just came out. But the people on the right have generally eschewed what's on the left and seen it as being antithetical to what it is that they believe in on the right. You guys obviously have a much more integrated view of the two sides. But this is then the synthesis of the two sides is what I've been calling for a while, and a uh, book that I came <coughs> with uh, Brett Einan uh, that we published with AAC and you a year and a half ago called Open and Integrative, which we talk about this as rebundling, not unbundling, is um, that what we need is to, is to do more to put what's on the left in the service of what's on the right. And that one could argue, or I, I would argue, that we cannot imagine a democratic and equitable version of liberal arts education, which we desperately need if we want to address another one of our critical issues of social inequality, without putting what's on the left in the service of what's on the right. And that, that to me is one of the great, it's not the total of blended learning, but it is a really important, meaningful subset of blended learning. I will, of course, make all my slides available to you. So tools like the Open Learning Initiative, and I'm guessing many tools like the ones that you guys are talking about and work with, which is where I'd love to have more examples. But this is just you know, kind of a gold standard of a certain kind of example. Open Learning Initiative, this is the adaptive intelligent tutor statistical package that come, came out of Carnegie Mellon initially. Right? So it's adaptive in the sense that students work intensively getting immediate and targeted feedback. Then they come to class. Faculty. It can be done all self-driven, but the six huge randomized control trials at public universities have shown that the hybrid approach is much more powerful. If you have at least one day a week with a talented teacher and students working with the OLI materials, that you can actually create just as much learning. Actually, there's, there's absolutely the same amount of learning for students doing it on their own versus a traditional statistics course. In a hybrid context, you can actually cut the time on task almost in half. With greater learning, so that you could actually then move on to deeper problem solving, more advanced topics, or accelerate. So that's become a kind of gold standard for a very particular kind of, I guess, low level complementarity. And looking at the definition of blended learning from, the blend, from this conference's site, <laughs> it would be one subset of that capability. And it's a category of what I think of as kind of human-machine partnership. I, don't, I, I can't think of a better word than partnership that doesn't sound creepy, like partnership. <laughs> <laughs> right? But like my Fitbit, you know, when I pay attention to the data off my Fitbit, I don't feel like it dehumanizes me. It actually just empowers me to think about my health and my fitness in a different way. So this is one example of where I think machines and human judgment are in partnership, and that, it seems to me, is the future of blended learning. <laughs> I, I, for 25 years, I just thought of it as technology-enhanced pedagogy. But now I think of it like, that doesn't make a difference to think of it as a machine-human partnership. So 
So that's the bare beginnings of what it means to put the left in the service of the right. OLI in a hybrid format powerfully puts the left in the service of the right, and there are many examples of that across the country you know, that I can cite. So now I want to put those two sides in the context of a broader two by two quadrant. So if in this two by two quadrant or matrix, in which I want to focus on the upper right, the first quadrant, uh, tipping you off by putting a yellow box there, <laughs> <laughs> lest there be any confusion. So in some ways, the two sides of the chart I was showing you now become the ends of the x-axis. Let's do the other axis now. So this axis then, I would say, has at one end inclusive excellence. And this is the, the discourse that's developed, you know, AAC and U, I think, around 2000 coined that phrase. Lots of people have picked up on it. Howard Hughes Medical Institute, many others. Just this idea that excellence should be available to everybody, that, that, um, that what it means to be inclusive is not just to deliver a lower level of education to some people, but that you actually have a standard of what, that's about quality, not just about access. So what would be at the other end of that continuum? I would put exclusive excellence. That is not a term for anybody <laughs> because that's what college was for like 200 years, right? That's where qualified and prepared students went to rich and holistic environments. If you Google inclusive excellence, you'll get like 300,000 hits to like AAC and you and other things. If you Google exclusive excellence, you will find luxury resorts in Mexico. <laughs> not a term, not a higher ed term. An invisible term, which is, I think, so, which is so important about it. So one thing we can do with this matrix is to plot different parts of the higher ed landscape. So I would put some of the startup and disruptors, you know, like in the upper left, some of them very inclusive, you know, Mission U, Mission U, poor adult, poor working adults that they're trying to train, one year certification, coding, UX design, et cetera. You pay zero tuition until you get a job that pays you $50,000 or more. When you get a job at $50,000 or more, you pay them 15% of your salary for three years and that's your tuition. Just heard about another company that does something very similar, but you only owe them a percentage of the delta between the job you had and the new job you got after you got your degree. Not integrative, but very inclusive. Minerva University, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, startup, San Francisco, students end up studying in seven different cities. They claim they're the first elite university founded in the United States in 100 years. All the faculty teach online, all the students are together in a building in one place, very rich integration with the co-curriculum, most integrated curriculum I've ever seen. I'm envious of that. So I'd put, they went way down in the lower right. They are highly integrated and highly exclusive. I would put most liberal arts colleges and universities somewhere toward the exclusive end and in various degrees on the integrative side. And I would put most open access and public institutions sort of on the disintegrative side, and, but definitely at the integrative side. Any institution would be placed different. Parts of institutions may even be in different places. Like all two by two schemas, this does incredible disservice to reality. <laughs> I think what's interesting is that there's a lot of pressure pulling all liberal arts colleges up into this space, especially on the inclusive side. There's a lot of talk about making them more integrative, but some of your institutions may belong to the American Talent Initiative, for example, which is a consortium of the 270 most selective schools in the country pledging to increase the number of lower income graduates by 50,000 by 2025. At what will, for some of us, be great expense and reprioritization. So, there's, so we're being pulled up into that space toward inclusion. But a lot of those institutions are being pulled into the space through things like high impact practices and learning communities and first year experiences, et cetera. Elements of a liberal education that are now democratized across 
open access public institutions, four-year institutions, community colleges. So there's a, I think we're being pulled into that space. On the other hand, there's tons of stuff pulling, especially public institutions, toward the disintegrative side, right? Redu reduction of public funding, pressures on the workforce, the contingentization of the faculty, you know, a lot of things pulling toward the disintegrative. But to me, if we're thinking about writing a future for ourselves, if we're thinking about educational complementarity, if we're thinking about what is it that we are actually trying to get out of this new machine-human partnership in the context of education, it's so we can design for that quadrant. Is that for the first time in the history of higher education, we can actually seriously design for making education both integrative and inclusive because for the most part, we've never done both those things at once. So what matters in this quadrant? So inclusive achievement matters. Trying to figure out how to help everyone succeed. Also, much easier using digital tools along with a lot of other things. I would say then that active learning matters. I, I know you probably feel like I do, that, that active learning is still a thing, like people debate. <laughs> Seems <laughs> almost impossible. <laughs> I was at a conference of biology educators, and they were, somebody was presenting a study and said, and one of the you know, faculty subjects was a veteran teacher, but new to active learning. And I thought, how is that even a thing? <laughs> But if active learning matters and inclusive achievement matters, then technology matters. So many of you will be familiar with the oft-quoted and famous Freeman et al. article that appeared in PNAS a few years ago, where they did a meta study, 225 active learning studies, and their title is the headline, Active Learning Increases Student Performance in STEM. <laughs> and late in the article, they say, if the experiments analyzed here had been conducted as randomized control trials of medical interventions, they may have been stopped for benefit, meaning that enrolling patients in the control condition might be discontinued because the treatment being tested was more clearly beneficial. Like that's how powerful now the evidence is of certain fundamental things to make certain fundamental gains, and it's a combination of thoughtful active pedagogies and the use of certain technologies. To me, that's a, we've crossed a, a bar, or what I like to think of as we've raised the floor. So one of the things that we now can say about that quadrant, that the two sides of the chart enables, putting the left in the service of the right in thoughtful pedagogical ways, is that we now can establish minimal professional practice. And by that I mean, I believe that we're at a place where we should feel that institutions that are not supporting faculty, I won't pathologize faculty, institutions that are not supporting faculty to engage in the minimal professional practices that Freeman et al. and et al. point to are engaged in something the equivalent of educational malpractice. Right? That we now know a bunch of stuff that works and to not do it is to basically refuse people treatment that we know works because we're too busy you know, writing our next journal article or prioritizing something else. Or doing committee work. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I don't really, yeah, it probably comes out rather harsh. But this is really more just saying that I think we've crossed, we've crossed some meridian. And that's part of what it means. The first, the first quadrant is about raising the floor. And raising the floor has responsibilities. As they say in Spider-Man, with raising the floor comes great responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> never said that before, probably never again. <laughs> but we also know other stuff matters. So we like know that the whole person matters. Right? So you know, you all have a real keen sense of what we mean by the whole person. It's not just knowledge, skills, it's dispositions and maybe values if you're in a place that can stomach talking about values. Um, but at least these kinds of dispositions and other things that you might put up there, growth mindset, et cetera. I like to think of these as the hard skills. Some of you may have heard me say that before. And that's as in contrast to the so-called soft skills, like chemistry and econometrics and <laughs> you know, stuff you can learn in classes. 
And in fact, we know that dispositions or whatever you call them, traits, you actually can't teach them, right? You cannot engage in direct instruction in resilience. You have to design, but you can't cultivate them. And to cultivate them, you have to design environments in which they're more likely rather than less likely to be cultivated. And those environments are unscripted ones, unscripted, guided learning contexts. What, you know, is one, a huge part of the qualities that make high impact practices high impact. is an image that John Seeley Brown has been using since the 90s, but this comes from a piece he wrote in 2008 called Minds on Fire, of just knowledge as an iceberg. Stuff above the waterline is the what, and the stuff below is the how. He says most people will live their lives below the waterline. Most college curricula are designed for above the waterline. And now, I think as we're thinking about the future of liberal education, it's about kind of looping back and forth between above and below the live line. The conversation we were having earlier about experiential, really thoughtfully integrated experiential learning is about moving back and forth. But this is where, this is where you need the whole person. It's in the rest of the iceberg. We also know that relationships matter. I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with the Purdue Gallup uh, survey that they've done now twice, 30,000 alumni from a whole range of institutions, asking them whether they consider themselves to be flourishing and engaged in their work 20 years after college, and then ask them what they did <coughs> during their college education. And that's the punchline. If you had either of those two things, an adult mentor who cared about you or worked on a sustained project of a semester or longer, you are 74% more likely to be engaged in your work 20 years later, along with a bunch of other interesting things. Like one of their questions is, have you been recognized by your community for your civic leadership? Correlates ridiculously with having worked on a sustained project or a semester or longer. I'll just break down the data for you a little bit here. So, 64% had a professor who made me excited about learning. 27% had a professor that cared about me as a person. 22% had a mentor who encouraged my goals and dreams, but 14% had all three. 32% a long-term project, 30% internship, 20% involved significantly in extracurricular activities, 6% had all three. Now this is looking back 20 years. 20 years from now, I'm guessing this will be different given our emphases on things like internships and capstones. And but part of this is we didn't need Silicon Valley for our institutions nationwide to be delivering a disintegrative experience. <laughs> That's what this data shows. And we also know that deep engagement matters in this quadrant, right? So inclusive achievement matters, active learning matters, relationships matter, whole person matters, and then deep engagement matters. And here, I want to tell you a bit of an arc of a story. You can see where I am on time. Um, that comes out of a project that we've been running at Georgetown now for three years called the Regents Science Scholars. And it's a project that was designed to support low-income, first-generation students to succeed in the biomedical sciences, where we had a real issue. So these are students who are qualified to do the work, but coming from under-resourced high schools, and for all kinds of reasons, we're just hemorrhaging out of first-year science courses. I'm sure a very familiar problem to each of your institutions. So it was launched in 2016 to support this population. Um, has two components, which I'll break down here. Um, a summer bridge program where they come in residence for five weeks and then online modules that they get in every other summer and now during winter breaks. Non-credit online modules. Just quickly, it's had an incredible impact. It's both gratifying and as Heidi Elmendorf, the director, would say, now deeply embarrassing because now we know what we could have been doing for all these years, the, the people we were failing, just back to this minimal practice. But now, in this last class, 
22% of the matriculating class at Georgetown in biology was low income first generation. And four years ago, it was 2%. And that's the hardest way to get into Georgetown. Uh, we have um, 2,000 applicants for 90 matriculants. So the story that I first want to tell about this takes place at my wife and my favorite winery, and that is not a coincidence. <laughs> it's probably now in full disclosure to also say that the person who directs this program is also my wife, or not, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> is my wife. <laughs> I do not have another wife. <laughs> <It's not there. laughs> so that's her standing there, and that's the winemaker, Jeff White, of this winery out in Virginia called Glen Manor Winery. And this story begins at a barrel tasting that we went to at Glen Manor. He was doing all this really interesting you know, barrel tasting. I don't know if you guys have been to a barrel tasting, but that's where, if you remember the Case Club, you get to go out and taste the wine out of the barrels. But in his case, he'd been doing a 10-year series of experiments with domestic yeast, or, or uh, commercial yeast, versus what he calls feral yeast, meaning the yeast that just comes naturally out of the environment. So we went to the barrel tasting, and I was just having a great time tasting the wine, and my wife was thinking, hey, I could build a whole curriculum around this. Because <laughs> he was complaining that he didn't, he wasn't like a big, rich winery. And he couldn't test his soil in ways that big, rich wineries could. And she said, oh, well, has anybody ever mapped your microbiome? <laughs> I'm like, I have a personal question. <laughs> or the nerdiest pickup line ever. <laughs> and he says, you got a lab that does that? He says, yeah, I'm going to have a whole research team in a week. And by research team, she was referring to the 30 first generation low income students that were coming in for summer bridge because they went to terrible high schools and they needed a longer on-ramp to get into Georgetown and succeed in science. That was the research team. So that's the aerial view of the winery. That's his own soil maps that he had figured out to that extent that helps him figure out where to plant. Basically, this is just a summer bridge course to get students to learn a little bit of biology and chemistry, but also to get them used to the standards of a place like Georgetown. But very importantly, what she would say is that we covered everything we would have covered without this project. We just did everything in the context of this project. So every con topic we would have covered, we just did it in the context. But on the first day, she said, you guys were a research team. She talked about Jeff White. She talked about Glenn Manor. She said, for five weeks, we're going to do this project. You're scientists, right? They haven't even matriculated at Georgetown. The people who already think the admissions office has made a mistake, they're already burdened with a sense of imposter syndrome. And she's saying, you guys are scientists, you're going to look at this project. And what was really powerful about it, and I'm sure there's many of you who have worked on such and taught such projects, is how important it is to have an authentic audience. Within a day, everything was about would it help Jeff? Like, how should we put it in, pe how should we plate them in petri dishes? They said, I don't know what would help Jeff. How should we represent the data? I don't know what would help Jeff the most. This is an email from one of the students on day three or four as they're, they spent you know, a whole week designing the experiment. No hod. She says, I've been thinking about the design of the lab all night. Right? It was an email a professor wakes up to. And I think I have an understanding now after reading the material all over again. My suggestion is to create an experiment with like 20 control groups. <laughs> I'll tell you no, it's authentic. <laughs> And then she goes on. Does this seem possible? Can this lead me to understanding its flavor profile, giving Jeff the best possible taste? But these are all 18-year-olds, of course, who supposedly don't drink wine. <laughs> the, first, the first technical article they read, like on gram staining or something from this field, from viticulture, they said, write all the technical terms on the board you don't know. And the first one that went up was Merlot. <laughs> and a fierce debate over how to pronounce terroir. <laughs> but yeah, so Jeff, 
So they designed, that's all their design. They figured out every single thing, which rows they wanted samples from, high, low. They figured out the slope. They wanted the top of the hill, the bottom of the hill. They wanted the surface of the dirt. They wanted it a foot down, and uh, et cetera. They did decide, as they said during their final presentations, that they would do Cabernet only because that's Professor E's husband's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> this was my contribution to science. <laughs> So first, we just went out and collected the soil samples. Then they worked on them in lab for weeks while they learned all this other concepts of biochemistry. And then at the very, uh, this is their processes. So I, I'm an English professor, so I'm hoping this slide needs no explanation. <laughs> Somebody in this room knows what that slide is. So <laughs> and then at the very end, we took them out to the winery. And what's really powerful about this, and it doesn't have to be a winery, it doesn't have to be beautiful, it doesn't have to be an hour away. I've seen this phenomenon, as I'm sure you have, with this kind of work. Like that right there, those are students who are looking for their dirt, right? They got up to the top of the hill, and they're like, oh my god, it's row 12. I've been working on row 12 for a month. And they were literally taking selfies of them <laughs> and their dirt. <laughs> they owned that dirt. Because yeah. that was their dirt. And then we went down to the crush pad of the winery, and it, seven different teams presented their entire process and their findings. And that's the winemaker, that's his nephew. Good help, Jeff. Some, it's an ongoing project. This is, that's Jeff turning to them and saying, what's next? You can only make so much progress in five weeks. 16 of the 30 opted to continue as undergraduate researchers in the lab on this project in the fall, which is extraordinary, first semester. Again, these students have not matriculated into Georgetown yet. They're in a summer bridge program because they think they're stupid. But they're in a summer bridge program because they went to a terribly resourced high school. So that's also this quadrant. Whether students think it matters, matters. A lot. So a question you might be asking yourself is, what does that have to do with blended learning? <laughs> or maybe not, but now you are. There's your definition again. So in addition to this course-based undergraduate research, the cure that's going on in this class, as they say, and the experiential learning, a really key piece of this, as I said earlier, are these online modules. So that's what happens in their residential summer bridge, but between the first and second, second and third, third and fourth year, there's these online modules that um, are knowledge reinforcers, and we call them bridge modules. And they're both to focus on threshold concepts of courses coming up that they're about to take, and it also continues to build intellectual community, which is huge. These are students who have to go home in the summer, they need to be with their families, they need to go earn money. Knowledge melt and also identity melt is a huge issue. These are non-credit modules for all kinds of reasons. And they're all bridges, bridge to genetics, bridge to organic chemistry, bridge to physics, bridge to disciplinary writing. Whatever is coming up in their next semester, they get these non-credit booster shots. So what's blended is the whole arc of what it takes to help these students succeed over all four years. There's nothing really blended, per se, about the Feral Wine Project, but if you think of what does it take for an institution to support first generation low income students to succeed in STEM. That's a blended problem. And I think one of the interesting things that I've been thinking about with rebundling is not just about individual courses, but what does it mean to rebundle a curriculum? What's high tech, what's high touch? What can we scale, what shouldn't we scale? What can we do virtually, what can't we do virtually? So it takes both to design for that quadrant. All right. Just a few more slides, then no, I'm done. So back to Daniel 
and machine human complementarity. So the question really isn't, are machines going to be smarter than humans? Or there's some people who think that. If you read like Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, he's the director of the Institute for the Future of Humanity at Oxford. It'll scare the bejesus out of you. <laughs> I gave it to one of the very young members of my team, and I said, the punchline is, <laughs> you're screwed and I'll be dead. <laughs> By the time any of this happens. <laughs> You should read this, because this is really friendly stuff. But <laughs> setting aside the question of superintelligence and this superintelligence explosion that Nick Boston predicts, it's not about whether machines are going to get smarter than humans. It's whether, as machines get better at being machines, which they are at a very rapid rate, can humans get better at being human? And I think that has to be the project of liberal education and higher education. And I think that there's something slightly different, slightly different about being, helping people be better at being human than merely trying to make people better people, which has always been sort of liberal education's project. But really understanding what is it that makes humans distinct from machines and, and what does it mean for us to maximize our humanity I've always been, that's the liberal education tradition, but I think we need to up our game. I think we need to seriously up our game. We want to address social inequality, we want to address polarization, we want to be able to even comprehend the machine intelligence that we're unleashing. Some version of that is what education's complementarity has to be. Some people have suggested to me that I need a z-axis that's quality. And we could have a whole different conversation about the role of design and assessment and learning feedback loops to ha have that z-axis to help us get through the quadrant to the point of greatest value of inclusivity and integration. I mostly just want to end with sort of this vision of that z-axis, which is to say that I think at minimum, what we can now talk about is that we've raised the floor and we've started to identify a new ceiling. And the new ceiling is a machine-human complementarity that puts us in a position to help humans be better at being human. And that's, to me, the space for blended learning, the space for design, the space for higher education going forward. Thank you.